So we just got through the traffic and we're on N4 on our way to the Accra Digital Centre for today's first day of the Tech in Ghana conference. So right now I'm moving smoothly. Tech in Ghana is the leading UK Ghana platform dedicated to strengthening and showcasing Ghana's tech ecosystem. Launched in 2017 by Akosua Anabil, the platform has attracted participation from the biggest multinational brands in the world alongside the region's decision makers, investors, fastest growing scale-ups and founders. The event's held twice a year in London and Accra, supporting the burgeoning tech industry by providing a platform that brings the ecosystem together for global knowledge exchange, valuable networking and showcasing the latest innovations. Director of Regional Social and Policy Research at GSM Intelligence, which is a research arm of the GSME. My first participation at Tech in Ghana was in 2017, so I feel like I've been part of this journey, you know, since then. Hi everyone, so I'm here at Tech in Ghana, the 10th edition, and I've just bumped into the wonderful Izzy Obing. How are you doing, Izzy? I'm good, how are you? I'm well, and this is the first time we've actually met face to face in Ghana. We normally yes. bump into each other at events in London. Yes. Yeah. For the audience it would be great for you to share all things about yourself, mm -hmm. you know, what led you to getting into tech and, and also what led you to starting Foundervine. Absolutely. So I have been in Ghana for three years now, but before that I spent most of my life in the UK thinking about uh, what it would mean to build the digital tech ecosystem, thinking about what it takes to help founders start up and scale up. And in the UK, the type of work we do, which is building accelerators, which is helping founders access networks, access capital, the things that they need to grow. Um, although there's a need in the UK, particularly for diverse founders, overlooked founders, those who um, are typically not seen and as present in the startup ecosystem, in Ghana, there's an even greater need. So um, we have got an office in Ghana. We have an office in the UK. And in the UK, we support entrepreneurs who are um, often at the scale stage and who are looking to take those first steps into um, you know, scaling to a certain size or raising investment. And we focus on that. In Ghana, the need is different and our work is different. So we focus on younger people. We focus on small grants. And so we run a program called the Ghana Science and Technology Explorer Prize in consortium with four other partners here and we support 14 to 16-year-olds in getting the skills that they need to build the innovation of tomorrow. Right, okay. And we also have a small grants program where we fund uh, Ghanaian social enterprises um, and Nigerian social enterprises directly as well. Wow. So that is a huge spectrum from uh, the UK all across to um, Ghana, and you also added Nigeria as well. Yes. So... In terms of the people that come to you with like their business ideas, mm. you know, some people I know are very passionate about their ideas. How do you get them to kind of formulate those passions through the Founder Vine program? So mm. I've got a passion to start a tech company um, in fintech, for example. Mm. How do I then take that and present that in the right way uh, to either Founder Vine or potential investors? Absolutely. So um, being at Tech in Ghana today has been a really interesting one for me because I've spent time sort of speaking to some of the startups who are at the stores and asking them about what their business model is, you know, what their operating model is, you know, how they generate investment. And what you find is that founders often, they're... They get what it takes from their perspective to start up, but they often don't fully understand what investors are looking for, right. and they don't understand how to frame what they do in a way that would be 
engaging and interesting to potential partners as well. So for our programs that target early stage founders, we spend a lot of time helping them kind of understand that perspective. You know, what is an investor looking for in your business? What do you need to do to structure your financial model, to structure your operating model in a way that is investor backable? And if your business is not typically investor backable, how do we instead focus you on generating uh, the traction that you need and getting those customers in to make sure that you can be sustainable that way? So a lot of work in particularly for women and those from backgrounds where they maybe not have had as much what we call social capital, Mm -hmm. essentially that kind of access, Um, we help them kind of build their confidence and self-esteem. And then we help them more technical side of business building and partnership development and sales marketing, all of those things through our um, early stage programs as well. Right. And what have been some of the kind of high highlights in terms of success stories mm-hmm. um, that have come out of your, your program, whether that's been in the UK and, and also as we're in Ghana, and in, in Ghana, because you said you do programs for like um, teens mm-hmm. who... who it, you know, getting into tech or getting into, you know, the startup ecosystem. Absolutely. So, um, real spectrum of uh, founders we've supported over the years and so lots of different stories and um, ones that stand out to me immediately are stories like um, Pollen Pay. So, Pollen Pay is a Manchester-based buy now, pay later company and they brought that kind of buy now, pay later model to the UK really interesting company who um, just raised raised their Series A, um, £21 million, um, and they were part of our Barclays Black Founder Accelerator, Mm -hmm. uh, which has supported over um, 100 founders since it started. Um, And we see lots of really interesting businesses who are able to get access to the people and to the networks and to the support that they need to raise or to kind of grow in different ways. Um, For our earlier programs, uh, we've had students come into our programs who maybe have, um, so there's one in particular young lady um, was doing her dissertation on how VR could be used to help people with dementia and through our um, early stage program she was able to actually learn what a business was she was able to find co-founders she was able to build her business model mm-hmm. with expert advice um, and she was just able to kind of take something that was kind of nothing into something that was backable and later on she won a number of awards that kind of thing so we spend a lot of time um, helping people who just don't really understand the basics and be their kind of first friend in yeah. starting a business that's a big one for us and hopefully take them along on that journey whether that's access to space um, through our partnership with WeWork where every year we offer 100 diverse founders um, space at WeWork uh, whether that's through our accelerators um, in partnership with Barclays, with Lloyds, where we take people through that process of investment readiness, or whether that's through some of our other initiatives, um, like our partner events, where we bring policymakers together um, and talk about how we can build a more equitable um, startup ecosystem for everyone. That's amazing. So it's been fantastic having this chance to speak with you. If people want to connect um, with Founder Ryan, someone might be watching this and saying, hey, I've got an amazing idea but I need some of this structure and framework and the kind of business principles which you walk your, your clients through or your um, people on your program mm-hmm. where can they connect with you um, going into 2023 when is the next program starting mm-hmm. and yeah, where can they connect with you either in the UK or here in Ghana Absolutely. So um, we are Foundervine on all social media platforms. Um, Foundervine.com is the website. Um, and so we're always open to people reaching out to us, connecting with us on social media through our newsletter, which is Foundervine.com slash newsletter. Um, and yeah, we have programs launching all the time. Um, so just stay tuned. And I guess the other aspect of that is about having that network, you know, like they say, that, that saying, you know, you can move at a certain pace on your own but you can move faster Absolutely. together and, Absolutely. and that network begin and brings that acceleration mm-hmm. and support that's needed for people who have got amazing you know innovative ideas mm-hmm. and um, businesses that they want to launch to doing that Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. listen it's been a pleasure as always talking to you is it?
London to Accra, I cry about when I touch down in Kotokam Got love for my people, we go hustle every day, more power to my people The hustlers, street sellers to the sweet mothers On the grind every day, helping each other Making moves, make it happen, that's the signature Ghana we there, throughout the world Elisha, and Elisha is a web 3 enthusiast Elisha is a web 3 enthusiast Can you tell me what a web 3 enthusiast is, Elisha? Okay, so web 3 has to do with reimagining the internet. Okay. Currently, the internet is centralized. What that means is a particular group of people control the internet. So even if you're using a platform, instead of you having a say on the platform, you are just seen as a means to an end or not an end in itself. So you're using a platform, but you can't um, help in the decision-making process of the platform. The platform decides when they release a particular update and what kind of updates they release. With the Web3 ecosystem, what we are trying to do is to reimagine the internet where everybody who uses a platform can contribute to that particular platform. So it uses elements that are built based on blockchain technology, okay. including the tokens, which are the cryptocurrencies, um, which include Bitcoin, Ethereum, or whatever cryptocurrency the owner of the project or the platform or the platform creates. But then we also have other elements like NFTs which allow us as individuals on the internet to be able to treat digital um, should I say artifacts, right? So uh -huh. it could be an artwork, it could be music, it could be movies, just creative work being traded digitally in a way that doesn't allow for people to count, like create counterfeit, mm -hmm. right? Because in the real world, we have a lot of people making knockoffs of original stuff that right. creators are putting a lot of work into, and that is something that usually takes a lot of value away from these creators. So NFTs are changing that. There are so many NFTs that are popular. Born APH Club, Crypto Punks, all of these things have become really popular. Your favorite uh, footballer or influencer or musician probably yeah. is putting an NFT as yes, a yeah, yeah, yeah. on Twitter. Then there's the metaverse, right? The idea and the conception of a new world where we are living online. So virtual reality, augmented reality, where we are creating a new space. So this conversation that we are having right now uh -huh. will be had in the metaverse in the future. Okay. So the we are just create characters. Exactly. And these characters could be NFTs too. Okay. So then your NFT or whatever image you've created for yourself or identity can equally translate into a character in the metaverse. So Web2 basically is um, a web built on the blockchain, more decentralized, meaning it's not owned by anyone, uh -huh. um, basically more accessible because all the controls that exist with the current financial system and the current internet system do not exist. Whether you're in Ghana, you're in Nigeria, you can have the same access as someone in London or someone in New York. Okay, so this is very interesting what you're talking about, Elisha. By the way, how old are you? I'm 21. 21 years old. Yeah. And how long have you been into this? Web 3 years. 2017. 2017. I was 16 then. So uh, 16 is when you started getting into Exactly. Tech. Okay. Yeah. And learning about crypto, crypto etc. Yeah. So do you trade yourself doing crypto trading? Yeah, yes. I, I, I do trade sometimes. I don't spend a lot of time trading because I have to work. And okay. trading can be very, very, a very demanding job. Right. What I do is there are a couple of cryptocurrencies that I usually think have a good potential long term. Yeah. So I buy some, keep them, go up, I cash out. Right, okay, yeah. In, in terms of Web 3.0, we're right, here at Tech in Ghana, Iran, which is West Africa and Africa. How do you see Web 3.0 kind of changing the playing field and the landscape for people in Africa? And, yeah. and what that means in terms of the, you know, the global markets or global Bitcoin, NFT, blockchain space. So first off, the cryptocurrency space has changed a lot of lives. People are making a living through trading. People are making a living through the jobs that have been created. So many Nigerians, a couple of Ghanaians, so many Kenyans, so many South Africans are working in the Web3 space. Right. So right off the bat, the Web3 space is having a direct impact on the lives of individuals on the African continent and on the West African continent specifically. Okay. But beyond that, the creativity, the innovation that Web3 allows for people to like do or make would create a lot of other opportunities that go beyond direct impact. So. For instance, in the future, people will be using applications that allow them to send money 
across borders in Africa. And they wouldn't even know that in the background, the money that is being moved is actually cryptocurrency, right? So what that means is that a lot of aspects or parts of our industry mm -hmm. that are underdeveloped for one reason or the other can end up seeing a lot of innovation and a lot of development because of the web 3 space. And we're already seeing this with one big example, moving money across West Africa. It's very difficult to send money from Ghana to Nigeria, but there are just two countries in between us, and I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. But if you have a Bitcoin wallet, I have a Bitcoin wallet. You send me your address, I just send the money to you. It's really that easy. That's so so that's, that's just right. one example, right? Yeah. So, so many examples of ways like things could change. Corporate governance, the whole concept of decentralized autonomous organizations, mm -hmm. like a decentralized way of um, managing a company. All of these things can change the structures of the way we build in the tech industry, which would even go beyond just the blockchain space. So the OT industry would have a lot of impact on the lives of people in West Africa. We are seeing it already, and there's more yet to come. To come. Yeah. You sound too intelligent for to a 21 year old. To me, it sounds like some companies could be with someone like you uh -huh. um, working behind the scenes in terms of their work went through their zero strategy. Mm -hmm. So, do you do consulting or yeah. anything yeah. like that? So most, um, in most instances, uh, people reach out to your LinkedIn yeah. and they're getting into the Ghanaian or Nigerian space. And I'm like, okay, let's jump on the call. Sometimes I don't even take money, but I, I take money for the people that are coming to right. this video. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, that's a joke. Um, so anyone who wants to talk, really, forget the money and all of that. If you want to enter the Ghanaian space, um, you can reach me on social media. Yeah. If you search for GH Crypto Guy on Twitter or LinkedIn, I'll pop up. Uh -huh. and you can talk to me about wanting to enter the African or Ghanaian market when it okay. comes to the Web2 space, and I'll do my best to tell you what I know. And what are some of the main platforms? So people that want it in the UK, I use eToro. Yeah. Have you probably heard of them? Yeah. To do crypto e trading yeah. and stocks and shares. So what are the platforms in Ghana? So Vinyl's platform, by Bitcoin. All of these are platforms that you can use to trade and buy cryptocurrencies in Ghana. But the top two are really Binance and Paxful. That's great. Listen, if anyone wants to follow you on social media, at GH Crypto Guy. G H C R Y P T O G U Y. Yeah. Well, this has been a great interview or conversation, I should say, yeah. with the GH Crypto Guy. I just met him at the Tech and Ghana um, conference here in Accra, and I'm looking forward to seeing all the transpires and, you know, this happening in this space absolutely from a tech perspective and also we'll be following your journey as well so all right all the best thank you yeah? nice to meet you too all right sure. then making moves ghana live and direct to tech in ghana the hustlers street sellers to the sweet mothers on the grind every day helping each other making moves make it happen that's the signature ghana we there throughout the diaspora making moves in so this is the virtual reality experience from Dovacin. Over here you can experience VR games and experiences we build for brands and companies. And we also have our travel tourism platform that you can explore. Basically handling everything that involves virtual reality and building a database in Ghana. My name is Robertson and I'm part of the Gamers Association Ghana. Uh, we are a collection of um, organizations uh, governing the gaming industry here in Ghana. So we have 14 companies and over here you can see some of our uh, partners. So I'm with Letty Arts and for with Letty Arts our main vision is to tell the African story in a fun and interactive way with our African heroes. How, how can people connect with the Ghana Gamers Association online or on social media? Okay, so um, you can search for the Ghana Gamers Association just on Google and on Instagram, 
It's just Ghana's gaming association. When you search for it, you see us. London to Accra, Accra, but when I touch Making down, moves, I'm Ghana. Ghana. So we've just come out of a great session here at Tech in Ghana. Um, it was all about prop tech. So property and people wanting to invest in real estate or land purchasing is a huge growth area within the Ghana market and technology is playing a huge role within that space. So I'm here with the Vice President of Cecil Global, Dan Soa. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Julian. Can you just let the audience know who you are? My name is Dan Soa. I'm Vice President of Strategy and Operations at Cecil Global. I lead the Accra and Lagos sales teams and also help with obviously strategy and operations at a management level. Now Cecil Global, we are a company that manages the end-to-end -end transaction process in property acquisition. One of the major issues in acquiring property in Africa is fraud. And another thing is access to finance. And so what we do is rather than just like collating properties that are available we actually go through the process of verifying these properties making sure that we are dealing with the rightful owners who have the rightful title so we've done the first level of um, due diligence so you know definitely once you're on our platform looking for properties it is a verified property which means that the title is good you're dealing with the rightful owner the second thing that we do is also give individuals access to professionals in the real estate you know process flow because buying a land you do have to do your due diligence so even though Cecil has done it's important for you as an individual to satisfy your own curiosity and and legal requirements as well and do your due diligence so we will link you up with the architects the surveyors the lawyers anyone you need to do the necessary due diligence on the property we do that and then, you know, property is one of the most expensive things anyone will buy. So we also have access to financing. We have access to over $550 million of financing on our platform through our financial partners and investors. And the way it works is, again, right back onto the platform. You can check out your mortgage eligibility, have a list of all the documentation that you are required to submit and submit that um, application electronically. You don't have to be in Ghana. There's always a set of sales rep who will help you each step of the way. I know technology is the end thing, but you know, humans also need to deal with humans, yes. right? <laughs> so there is um, the human element that is going to guide you, be your interface between any institution that you're doing, dealing with, but obviously leveraging off tech. So for someone who's in the UK or the US or Europe or Australia, um, who's seen Ghana as a place that they would like to you know, invest in or become a part of, what would maybe three tips or words of advice would you give them in terms of, you know, that process? Right. I think the first tip also always rests on the individual. Be very clear on what your objectives are. Not everything is suitable for everyone at any given point in time. Like I said, with um, CESO, there would be an individual to guide you through. So we actually have a needs assessment. So we go through, try to find out what it is you're looking for. Because sometimes people have a property in mind or a certain view that may not be accurate on the ground. So we help to clarify that. We also encourage people to participate in our virtual tours. It's a trusted platform, but we also want you to see what it is that you're buying and also to look beyond properties to locations. So if you want to buy a property in location A, it comes back to the needs assessment. What kind of an individual are you? How important is it to you that there's a school or a pub or a restaurant nearby? Because, I mean, Ghana is so much bigger than Accra. And Accra is not representative of the whole of Ghana. And um, I would say 99%, if not 99.9% .9 of our, our customers, as in purchasing customers, are from the diaspora. And these are people that we have taken through these processes. And um, they never regret the decision. So just be clear on what you want. There's always someone there to guide you every step of the way. Be open-minded and look beyond the property and I'll just say just just trust the process really. What else would you say in terms of the real estate market in Ghana? What, what have you seen happening in terms of trends and where you see the, the market going in say the next five years? Well that's interesting. I've been in real estate since I graduated which is I mean more than 12 years now right so um, the real estate boom in Accra really started around the late 2000s just before you know the credit crunch and all that that's when property was on the boom, that the property industry was on the boom. A lot has changed since then. 
people's preferences have changed. Now the whole world is more like a global village, right? So exposure to everything has changed people's perceptions of what they want, what they think they want, <laughs> right? And what they actually need. But it's been a very, very interesting progression. Like with the boom came the introduction of mortgages, for instance, which gave younger people the opportunity to acquire property because back in the day, people built houses when they were approaching retirement. Right which necessarily isn't a bad thing, maybe that's their objective, but access to finance is like an elevator. It just amplifies the opportunities for so many more people and that has quadrupled in its effect. You know, um, in the last two years even, um, what I would say is probably COVID. COVID. COVID was a reflection point for the whole world which actually has impacted our real estate industry like you said over 5,000 African Americans coming in and you see how that is changing you know the landscape is even changing the kind of buildings that are being put up for the better yeah. right for the better because you realize that people coming from abroad have a different perspective and sometimes and no offense to my Ghanaian brothers and sisters a broader perspective right. and this is placing a demand on developers to do more and to do better rather than probably someone homegrown in Ghana you don't know anything outside of what Ghana yes, is yeah. right and yes. yes and that's how it's changing so developers have to be you know up on their feet with their innovation with their layout it's not enough to just build a house and yeah. think that someone is going to buy so buyers are in a better position to get better deals mm -hmm. and post covid i mean property prices in accra have constantly been on the rise right, right. and there are certain segments of the market that were overpriced and covid in a way caused those bubbles to best okay. in a way that people can now enter the market at more reasonable price points and with the influx of the diaspora, a lot more attention is going off Accra because everybody wanted to be in Accra because it seems everything is happening in Accra. But there's so much opportunity in other parts of the country. A lot of um, attention is going on waterfront. So whether beachfront, riverfront properties, because the hustle and bustle of Accra is not for everybody. But it's also opening up people to the fact that I don't have to live in Accra you know, to, to, to make it or yeah, yeah. to be counted as relevant. Ebri, um, other scenic locations, pe places that people would have never ever considered living because of the external demand on things outside. It's, it's affecting the market in very, very yeah. dynamic ways. And it's an opportunity for locals and people coming from the diaspora to get into the market at a time where not much attention is increasing but it's still not like amplified yeah, so yeah. as an investor someone looking to move back into ghana it's a wonderful opportunity to plug in while prices are still low so that you can benefit when it goes up yeah, the, yeah the exactly yeah goes. yeah this is great listen for anyone who um, is interested in purchasing um can you just share your website details and any social media platforms and I know December's coming so if there's any tools you know if there's anyone who's going to be flying out and they're interested in going to see things physically how Sesso can help them right so we are on Instagram at Sesso Global at Sesso underscore global our website is www.sesso.global and you can give us a call on plus two three three two zero three four triple zero four one I jumped on the plane Listen, it's been a pleasure meeting you. So I'm here with James. His company is called Tape. That's correct. Yep, yeah, it's spelled T A Y P. Yeah. Um, James, I've connected with you in London. Yeah. It's great to see you out here yeah. in the car. Is the first time we've seen you in the car? Yeah. That's what we actually yeah, we've seen each other so many times in yeah. London. Now we've yeah. been seeing each other face to face in the car. Yeah. All right. So, just for the people watching. Can you just tell them a bit about yourself okay. and you know about tape? You know how what is tape? How did yeah. it come about? I don't even define myself about what I do, but I have been working with um, social media for like the past ten years plus, and through that I had the idea to instead of me doing marketing, social media marketing for companies, I thought, how about I just start my own social media company itself? Okay, you know, go all the way there. So. That's how the idea of tape came about. Right. Um, and the thinking of tape and what's behind it is that social media itself is actually quite a conspicuous concept. A lot of people uh, create content um, and they go through crazy lengths to create content to, um, you know, and it affects 
with people's mental health in many different ways. So I thought, how could I get around that and make something that the content is very easy to create and viral content could be created from the comfort of someone's own bed. So tape is based on voice notes only. A 90 second limit, mm-hmm. so long people talking for too long. Anything over 90 seconds is basically a podcast, as people say. <laughs> and then from a business model standpoint, yeah. what's the vision um, yeah. behind the business? The first way in which this app is going to make money is through sponsored topics. Okay. So, say for example, we're here in Accra. Yeah. yeah. Um, say Starbucks mm-hmm. wanted to launch a new burger or yeah, yeah, yeah. a new meal. Um, they could do a sponsored topic and say the new burger and um, they can target, it's only East Legon, so they target any, any people just in East Legon. Okay. So then people in East Legon can say, ah, oh, I tried that Starbucks burger, it was so delicious. Right. And now Starbucks has just got themselves a whole focus group just from using the social media app. Right. And that would be a sponsored topic that will go on the top of the topics when people are on their explore page. Okay. So that would be the initial way of it making money. But obviously, further down the line, um, ads will be considered. Cool. So if you had to go into Dragons then yeah. and pitch tape, how, yeah. would you, how would you pitch it to the, the Dragons? I'll say, give me money now, Jacob. Look, I'll actually explain that like, tape itself is a, is a voice note app, social media, 90 seconds. It's okay. to be the most accessible social media platform in the world. Can you just share with the audience where they can connect with you? Sure. So go to at tape.app on Instagram. Um, tape, just search tape on LinkedIn. Um, at put it on tape or on Twitter and at take the app on uh, TikTok. So we're basically everywhere. And go to take the app on um, the website and then sign up to the newsletter, guys. We want to see you on the waiting list. We want, we want to see you on there. So, right, we want to get you on the app as soon as possible. Okay. This is Julian with James from Tape. We're here at Tech in Ghana, making moves, Ghana. Station, make sure you connect with them and join the touchdown. Hi, my name is Louisa. I'm a Tap Tap Send. Tap Tap is a remittance app that gives you the opportunity to send money from the US, UK, EU, most of the foreign countries to whom. You can send from US to Ghana, to Nigeria, to Mali, to Cameroon, and a lot more at a cheaper rate. The rate is so wonderful. And the good thing about TapTap is we don't charge you even one Ghana CDs or one Peswa. Kindly download the app and send through TapTap. On the plane, London to Accra, Accra but when I touch down in Kotokam. Got love for my people, we go hustle every day, more power to my people. The hustlers, street sellers to the sweet mothers. On the plane. So I am here with the founder of Tech in Ghana, Akosua Anibal. So this is the 10th edition. Yeah. Wow. I know. Do you think time's going quickly? It has, because we don't, when you say 10th edition, usually people start thinking 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not. It's five years. Yeah. Two editions each year. Yeah. But to me, it feels like 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, in seriousness, it's, it's in, in some ways it feels like it's been a long time, but in others it feels like it's still early days. You know what I mean? When we see some of the conversations that are taking place, I start thinking about, wow, what more can we do around gaming? What more can we do around NFTs and the metaverse and areas that we've not previously explored? Right. That, this year has made it feel like there's so much more to learn. We've never done yeah. so much before, but it's, it's been brilliant. That's been great. How has it been in terms of you know, just this again, this, what's been the highlights for you this year? Oh, that's a good question. I think definitely bringing in the esports part, because mm-hmm. we've never done anything like that before. And I like the fact that we had that young energy, just as the backbone, the VR, yeah. all of that experience. And I used to have, like, I used to visualize that happening in our exhibition space. And the fact that I've seen it happen now, mm-hmm. I think that was a really big highlight. I think that our concept was really strong this year in terms of, like, having people beyond Ghana here. So, you know, 
do people like M. Copper and Move and having them involved in the conversation, yeah. the Global Tech Advocates conversation, connecting right with the rest of the world. I really love that. But also, of course, just hearing from people that we've seen grow over the years, yeah. Farmer Line, E Campus, Kingsley from Kudigo, etc. I think um, it's been really like interesting to watch their growth. Yes. Even seeing the way they tell their story yeah. is so different now, right? They're not pitching, yeah. they're speaking from experience and sharing a lot of the knowledge that they've like gained over yes. the years. Yeah, so yeah. I really enjoyed a lot of that. But yeah, a lot of highlights, but there are a few that come. And I feel what you just shared there around how diverse the ecosystem has become. Because yeah. I spoke to some of the young gamers earlier, the developers, mm. not even gamers, but the developers, mm. and just the passion, the energy, mm. they're passionate about you know, making an impact for yeah. Africa in, yeah. the, in their food. And, and that's the thing, that's the thing, you know, it's like, it's beyond just like showcasing tech, which is yes. what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like, for us, this is, this is about culture, yes. this is about impact, this is about like changing lives yes. in a way that's not a gimmick. Yes. You know what I mean? They yeah, yeah, really yeah. mean it. Like when they see, for example, you talk about gaming and they and they link it directly to employment and mm -hmm. opportunity, yeah. not just about winning. Just what I'm saying. Yes. So things like that, I think, are very important and inspire me just to keep making sure that I provide environments in which they can continue to thrive, yeah. they can continue to build networks, collaborate, feel like they're at home and showcase what they're doing. They're doing yeah. The audience who wouldn't ordinarily see it. See it, yeah. That's great. So what's next? We are looking at doing more in the ecosystem that goes beyond events. I think like we've, we will continue to obviously have the conference continue to do similar things in London. Mm -hmm. I think that's about embedding ourselves deeper into the ecosystem. And we are exploring the ways that we can do that. We don't want to um, just repeat the same as what everybody else is doing. Yeah, yeah. But what we're trying to do is like see where gaps are, see where we can fill them, see where our strengths are. Because what we've got is a really strong network. Yes. We've got quite strong influence now. We've got quite, um, we've got the ears of some very you know important people in the yeah, space that can people, help yeah. make change. So how can we um, utilize that in a way that benefits what the ecosystem needs, not what we think it wants, right? So I think we've got someone who wants to join. <laughs> she wants to join the <laughs> set. <side. laughs> so this is the girl. Yes, this is Irma. Irma with Irma. Well listen, it's been an amazing so, so two nice. days. Tech in Ghana, in Accra. Can I just say to thank you, a big thank you to you, Julian, for your support, unwavering support yes. over the years, because it's people like yourself that has given me the strength and inspiration to keep going. It's not easy to put on these events, yeah. but people like yourself definitely make it easier and make me feel like, you know, even though it's not an official, you're part of the team, you're part of the team. So, I, 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 I say thank you, And we're here, that's what we're, we're advocates, we're ambassadors, yeah. we're pushing and Africa to the world. And that technology plays a key part of that. Absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. We're out. Out.